The most recent agriculture ministerial of the BRICS, headed by India, was concluded virtually in August 2021. The meeting concluded with the adoption of the 2021 to 24 action plan, calling for more south to south cooperation amongst the BRICS BRICS countries to diversify agri food systems to increase farmers' incomes. This year's theme. was brics partnership for strengthening agro diversity for food and nutrition security the brics agricultural research platform will be used for more collaborative knowledge sharing previously the agriculture ministerial meeting of the brics held in 2019 called for greater agriculture information sharing with a focus on extending digital solutions icts and technology transfer in agriculture efforts to raise production and protect food security were also the focus however the policy track adopted by the ministers is often not publicly um debated and faced with domestic oppositions within the countries the regional plans also most um uh, also most times miss out um on the agrarian realities and specificities of the countries involved and lead to adoption of one fit for all pathway often by bypassing the contradictions in the recent past we have seen a slew of new liberal reforms in agriculture adopt undertaken by the brics countries the covid-19 pandemic has posed further challenges on agriculture supply channels and overall food security world over this panel today will present perspectives on agriculture policy directions undertaken in the brics countries the responses by the governments to tackle the fallouts of the covid-19 pandemic on the agriculture sector will be one of the major focuses of this session the panelists will critically engage in these issues and also speak about the various forms of resistance against the brazen new liberal reforms i would like to welcome um, professor ruth hall um, she is the south african research chair in poverty land and agrarian studies the chair is located at the institute for poverty land and um, agrarian studies uh, or plas at the university of western cape um, she has extensively written on land rights and land governance in africa she has also been involved with the um, brics initiative in critical agrarian studies which tries to study the agrarian changes taking place in the brics i want to share two very powerful images that really capture the south african state's response to covid on the streets and the one image which has been shown in various ways all over south africa and around the world is queues of people in low income areas outside supermarkets uh being guarded by police and army police and army that were defending supermarkets and the opening of supermarkets um and controlling the crowds of people who with their mostly meager social grants were trying to get access to food the second image is of state authorities confiscating the fruit and vegetables owned by street sellers people trading on the streets and in these two images we can see the contradictions and the clear distinction between the south african state's response to covid and the way in which it dealt with different parts of the food system on the one hand defending circuits of capital and capital accumulation and on the other hand cracking down and criminalizing the livelihood strategies of the poor in the midst of the south african state's response uh which has been a long and hard authoritarian type of lockdown we've also seen the promotion of long standing plans for the expansion of special economic zones big infrastructure development and mining deals but at the same time that we see covid as being a good moment for capital expansion within south africa south african capital uh which has been taking advantage of regional uh opportunities to reach a growing consumer market in Africa has been facing a crisis <clears throat> with the closure of South African supermarkets 
that have typically exported South African food uh, and particularly processed foods across the continent. So I think that actually there is a crisis for capital as well uh, in the region and that it's re-strategizing. So I think that a common theme that emerges for us is really an ever widening separation between the struggles on the ground and the kinds of solutions that are being proposed by government in this COVID moment. But it's also, as I say, a crisis for capital uh, and one in which uh, capital globally and within our BRICS countries and across them is strategizing. Now, I think that um, thinking about BRICS uh, the BRICS narrative is really a promise in a sense, uh, the idea that developing countries can generate their own growth, catch up with industrialized uh, nations, and really is a denial of the realities of imperialism. And the idea promoted by the BRICS themselves is that they will uh, spur on growth in their respective regions. We have been building networks with, uh, with researchers and movements uh, across some of the BRICS countries to look at how agriculture and food systems in a particular way are, um, are the focus of BRICS strategies, both in their own regions uh, and across them. For instance, the extensive connections between Brazil's Embrapa uh, in uh, commercializing African agriculture and promoting transnational land deals like Pro Savanna in Mozambique and many other engagements where uh, Chinese state capital and the African Union and others have been promoting the expansion of um, agribusiness and biotechnology in Africa. Um, so I think that there are extensive critiques and our understanding of the BRICS needs to move from this perspective that these are sub-imperialists that are not an alternative to global capitalism, but often are a route or an artery through which global capitalism is reaching new frontiers. Um, so uh, I want to build on three points. The first is to think about how land grabbing uh, and this expansion of extractivism and financialization is happening. Secondly, um, agriculture, food systems, uh, uh, during COVID. And thirdly, particularly the debate and the, the very uh, enormous struggles right now around contesting what recovery looks like and what is a recovery. And I think that the two events happening in these, these months that we are in now uh, are really where these contradictory perspectives um, are being fought out. And the one is the UN Food Systems Summit and the other, of course, COP26. So just to say, um, uh, South Africa as a brick is really a mini brick, uh, the most unequal society in the world in terms of income distribution and uh, a far smaller economy, less significant uh, than the other bricks, but very important symbolically within the BRICS group as legitimating transnational investments in Africa. So in that sense, South Africa is only considered part of the BRICS group uh, because it provides this platform and this route into African markets and particularly um, African uh, natural resources, uh, land, but also water and minerals, uh, and importantly, access to growing urban consumer markets for BRICS countries. Uh, and this is where I think we need to understand the role of South Africa within the group. So uh, BRICS have clearly become these new sites of expanded production of commodities, distribution, and in many senses, not necessarily the source of expansion in the region, but a route through which this is happening. And our research on this uh, really drew from, I think it was in 2013, when the BRICS summit was held in Durban. And at the same time as hosting the BRICS summit, the South African government announced a range of tax incentives and exemptions for global finance to use South Africa as a route through which um, to move into other African economies, essentially setting ourselves up as something of a tax haven for transnational capital and particularly promoting South Africa as a base for BRICS countries in regional expansion, particularly uh, into the mining and agricultural sectors.
And this is why I think that we need to think about the role of BRICS in agrarian extractivism uh, in an era of financialization in which global capital is looking for new frontiers for expansion. And this is the context in which we have followed the expansion of land grabs in Africa, uh, land grabs which have often failed, um, but have often given way to um, collaboration and alliances between domestic and global capital. Now, if we just move on to particularly the moment that we're in now and think about uh, this moment uh, of COVID, some of the key impacts of COVID within South Africa has been, as I said, this uneven treatment of the lo heavy lockdown of a lot of the economy, particularly the economy and the informal economy on which most people survive, alongside the defense and military protection of key sites of production and accumulation. At the same time, there have been forms of relief and mitigation and our research is showing how much even the relief and the mitigation is, is feeding directly into reinforcing capital accumulation uh, by corporates. And I'll give you a few examples. One of the most important first initiatives was a massive food relief drive uh, by the state with a, a solidarity fund. Almost all of the food bought through this process was processed foods produced by one of just four large corporations in South Africa. Relief vouchers, uh, cash vouchers for food were redeemable only at the major supermarkets, not in the informal sector. So you can see how public financing for COVID relief was feeding directly into this formal and highly concentrated economy of the food system with just four big food manufacturers and four big supermarkets. Just as context, um, uh, South Africa's whole agricultural and food system has been profoundly transformed under democracy in ways that might surprise uh, people from elsewhere that at the same time as political liberation, we deregulated the whole agricultural sector, allowing big corporations to take control of what had been state marketing boards and other institutions. And at the same time, the expansion of supermarkets. So whereas 30 years ago, only 10% of all food bought in South Africa was for, bought through supermarkets, that figure is now between 60 and 70% and rising. We are one of the most formalized, supermarketized countries in the world. So it's in this context that government responded. Secondly, there was relief for small scale farmers, many of whom lost access to their markets. Um, and the form of this relief came only in the form of vouchers that farmers could only use or redeem at agribusiness companies and at a small number of them that were given a contract by the state to provide production inputs. The, the companies that we've interviewed only supply GM seed from transnational companies. And this means that in the very process of mitigation and trying to provide relief uh, to um, small scale farmers in the midst of COVID, actually what was being done was the redirection of state financing into both domestic and global uh, agribusiness capital. So, and amidst this, of course, the World Bank has been arguing that uh, what Africa needs is more food supplies. And the irony in South Africa is that we have had, um, our economy has shrunk by 7% in the first year of COVID. And along this, alongside this, our agricultural production has increased 13%. And agricultural GDP is up. So we have, I'm hearing a very similar story in this respect with, with Brazil uh, and possibly in part with India, which is that we actually have expanding production, expanding capital accumulation in the agro food system at the same time as rapidly increasing hunger. In the first month, after the first month of COVID lockdown, 
47% of households had run out of food. All of our indicators of chronic poverty and hunger are up. Um, and there's been growing in income inequality as many working class people have lost jobs and has, as jobs have closed down. So I think that uh, in terms of the class contradictions and the contradictions of how the state has responded, uh, we see uh, a real crisis. At the same time, um, South African uh, agribusiness capital uh, and the supermarkets have spent the past 10 to 15 years expanding their footprint in the region and drawing on their role as a BRICS uh, member and as a member of the African Union to take advantage of regional integration, uh, special provisions to get tax exemptions and special deals uh, to expand across the continent. Just since the beginning of uh, COVID, our largest supermarket chain, ShopRite, uh, has closed all its stores in Nigeria and pulled out. The last uh, ShopRite stores in Kenya closed early this year. Uganda and Madagascar, both of them, uh, have closed their ShopRite stores. So a lot of these companies that provided regional markets for big South African farming and food manufacturing companies have actually started to lose their regional markets. And some of this has been because of the real risks with these long value chains, these supply chains. And so I think that actually at the same time that this moment has been a cementing of corporate power and profiteering, including acquisition to state financing, there's also a crisis for capital. So uh, that is part of the complexity. At the same time, the African Union, uh, the New Era Partnership for African uh, Development, NEPAD, CADAP is the CAADP, is the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. And all of them are responding to the COVID moment by trying to promote more transnational investments into agriculture across the region. And of course, a lot of this is being justified with uh, a climate narrative. So let me move on to the third point, which is about how social movements and state and others are contesting the recovery. So what I think that this uh, past couple of months is, has been showing us is that firstly, um, the UN Food Systems Summit has been captured by a corporate agenda. Um, the World Economic Forum and particularly the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa has been at the forefront of setting the agenda. In South Africa and across the region, social movements, some of them aligned uh, to La Via Campesina have been part of a boycott and an alternative counter mobilization to the UN Food System Summit. And the key issue there is about agroecology versus climate smart agriculture. And what we have seen is our government uh, as one of the great um, uh, advocates of climate smart agriculture being at the forefront of promoting uh, the African agenda of adapting to climate change uh, through climate smart agriculture and particularly pushing biotechnology. And all of this is being justified as a basis for uh, a production driven expansion of corporate agriculture. Despite all the evidence of the importance of uh, sustainable agroecology, including from the science community. Um, and we've seen these contradictions of accepted science now being negated and ignored in this, in this context. At the same time, in in the preparations for COP26, our government and others within the African Union have been promoting uh, and continuing uh, a number of false solutions, including a doubling down on biotechnology and trade liberalization as two pillars of the post-COVID recovery um, in, in the context of climate change. And I, we see this again and again, both with our business leaders that have been part of the COP26 preparation, that have been part of BRICS engagements, and also our government uh, representatives. 
So in all of this, I think that some of the key responses from uh, social movements, um, uh, community activist uh, organizations, sometimes in alliance with the trade unions, um, has been a combination of trying to build bridges between urban and rural movements, uh, promoting land occupations, not only for housing, but for access to land, for uh, food production in and around some of the cities, uh, calling for climate justice, uh, not just adaptation. Um, and right now we are heading to local government elections next week. And what we've seen is new platforms of activist formations and social movements uh, contesting, um, not contesting for power, but establishing platforms um, or a manifesto for people's power that has been popularized across the country. So in all of this, uh, I think that uh, one of the big calls has been to relocalize food systems and to use the COVID crisis as a moment to show that the extended and long supply chains of transnational capital, um, the reliance on uh, biotechnology and seed and chemical inputs these are the cause of the vulnerability in the food system uh, rather than the solution. So the emancipatory kind of politics is centering around reclaiming the, the commons, the land commons, the water commons, the climate commons, and the food commons. And some of the initiatives from the grassroots have been trying to build stronger links between uh, small scale producers and peasant producers of food um, and low income communities in and around the cities. But all of this is happening in a context of uh, quite an authoritarian response uh, to, uh, to COVID in South Africa. I will leave it at that and look forward to the discussion. Thank you.